The operator of Fukushima Daiichi has found water to be leaking at 14 locations at its crippled plant. It said the leaks apparently occurred after frozen water ruptured the pipes and that the leaked water did not contain any radioactive materials. TEPCO said about 40 liters of water leaked from a cooling system for a spent fuel pool at the number 4 reactor on Sunday morning, but the leak stopped when workers closed the valve. The utility said the leak forced the system to stop for 1 hour and 40 minutes, but the pool's temperature did not rise. The temperature near the plant fell to minus 8 degrees Celsius on Sunday morning. Ruptured pipes caused three leaks of water on the previous day. A uh, TEPCO official admitted that the utility failed to take sufficient steps to prevent pipes freezing in the cold weather. He said it will take quick action to protect the pipes. The situation is not stable at all. Japan's health ministry will subsidize half the cost to local governments and municipalities of installing highly sensitive equipment that detects radioactive cesium. The ministry will strengthen food safety regulations nationwide in April. Under the new safety standards, general food products will only be allowed to contain 100 becquerels of cesium per kilogram, an 80% reduction from the current permissible level. Baby food and milk will be allowed to contain 50 becquerels, and drinking water, just 10 becquerels. Some devices currently installed in local government offices are unable to measure low levels of cesium or are too slow in taking measurements. The health ministry decided that more sensitive equipment is needed, which can detect levels as low as 25 becquerels of cesium. Japan will launch a comprehensive study to monitor the impact of radiation exposure on wild animals and plants around the damaged nuclear plant in Fukushima. Levels of radioactive cesium in wildlife will be tested at 25 locations, both on land and at sea. The test areas will include places with high levels of radiation and those with less radiation, so that the results can be compared. Japanese red pine and bristle grass, as well as rats, frogs and mussels will be studied. Collection of some species has already begun. Researchers will check plant and animal appearance, chromosomes and reproductive function for the influence of any radioactivity. The rate of seed germination will also be studied. The Environment Ministry plans to compile an interim report by March 2013. The UN nuclear organization is considering opening an office in Fukushima to advise Japan in dealing with the prolonged aftermath of the devastating nuclear accident last year. Officials at the International Atomic Energy Agency say Fukushima Governor Yuhei Sato made the request in a letter to its scientists visiting Japan last October. He asked for the IAEA's presence to receive advice on decontamination and other technical matters linked to radiation. The agency says Foreign Minister Koichiro Gemba made a similar request last December. IAEA Chief Yukia Amano is supporting the idea, but when to set up the office and how it will be staffed are not yet decided. The agency says it will also consult with the Japanese government on ways to secure a budget. Nuclear inspectors from the International Atomic Energy Agency have begun their mission to Iran. They'll spend three days trying to determine the purpose of the country's nuclear program. NHK World's Mojtaba Sanati has the latest. The team, led by IAEA Deputy Director General Herman Nakats, arrived in Tehran on Sunday. The IAEA said in a report released last November that Iran may have carried out tests of a highly capable explosive device that is used to ignite nuclear bombs. The itinerary of the delegation remains undisclosed. But Iran has suggested it may allow the inspectors to visit a nuclear facility at Fordo near the central city of Qom where uranium enrichment began this month. Iranian Foreign Minister Ali Akbar Salehi said on Sunday Iran has nothing to hide and all questions will be answered during the visit. He even offered to restart stalled negotiations with the West over its nuclear development. Observers say 
Iran's reconciliatory stance is an attempt to defuse tensions as the U.S. and European countries ratchet up the pressure by tightening economic sanctions against the country. Mojtaba Sanati, NHK World, Tehran. Again, more disturbing video we're about to show you here on CNN. Fair warning to you. There was hardly any time to spare when residents near Japan's Fukushima nu nuclear power plant were forced to evacuate. People scrambled to leave, but the animals they left behind, pets, livestock, are still there. At least the ones that survived are still there. Kyung Law traveled to the so-called exclusion zone to see for herself. We are heading into the exclusion zone. This is the 20 kilometer mile radius around the Fukushima nuclear plant. And this is the area that the government has said the radiation is too high for people to live in. Some 70,000 people have evacuated out of the area. Now we wanted to see it for ourselves. What strikes you first is what you can't see. The people gone almost an entire year. Time has stood still except for the animals. Something that you see all over this area is there's livestock. These are animals that have been abandoned for almost a year now. A scene repeated across the exclusion zone throughout these small farming towns. Cows, ostriches, domesticated cats and dogs now running wild who've managed to stay alive in desperate conditions. The remains of those who haven't litter the region. Animal rights group United Kennel Club Japan found this female puppy, about six weeks old, dead from apparent disease. Ah, ah, Poor dog, says the volunteer. The group came into the exclusion zone last month with the government's permission to rescue strays. Then a sound from the back of the house. Another dog is alive. A puppy. And moments later, they find the mother. Rescuers cage the traumatized dogs and carry out the dead puppy. The dogs, two surviving puppies and the mother, are now out of the exclusion zone in the UKC shelter. Can you believe almost a year after this disaster, you're, there's still stray animals all over this area? It's shameful, says Yasunori Hoso. We kept asking the government to rescue these animals from the beginning of the disaster. He adds that there must have been a way to rescue the people and the animals at the same time. Japan's environmental agency tells CNN it wants to rescue as many livestock and animals as it can, but has chosen to take a prudent attitude because of the risk to humans in the contaminated area. This shelter is now home to 350 cats and dogs, all from the exclusion zone, the survivors. But now, the next challenge. UKC has tracked down almost all the owners who can't care for them since the residents, victims of the worst nuclear disaster in 25 years, remain homeless themselves. Mm. Great story, Kyung, and very brave of you to go inside. Uh, Kyung joins us now from Tokyo. Kyung, uh, what will happen to the rest of those animals? Well, to put it very frankly, Don, they're either going to die or they're going to be rescued. And since we're talking about an area that is cordoned off where people can't exactly go in to feed the, the livestock or to pull their dogs or cats out, uh, the chances of rescue dim every single day. That's what we hear from the animal rescue groups. Now, they are still sneaking in and trying to feed the cattle left behind, trying to pick up any stray dogs or cats that they can find. But really, the prospects go dim every single passing day. Kyung, I know that you uh, spoke to one of the last, he may be, I think you called him the last man standing there. Uh, and so my question is, is there a time frame for when other people will begin to return to their homes? Well, that guy is someone who has decided to stay in the exclusion zone, despite the fact that it is extremely dangerous. That area has to be decontaminated. All the soil has to be moved aside that has radiation in it. There's no specific time frame that the government has told any resident that they're going to be able to return to that land and live there safely. Now, we've heard some estimates bandied about, like maybe five years in some of the lower contaminated areas, but in the higher contaminated communities to the north and northwest, we're talking closer to 40 years, if ever. Mm. Uh, and the thing is, 
It's probably going to be, some of it I, I would imagine is going to be a wasteland forever. When I, when I spoke to some of your producers uh, here, uh, they said that this, may, this area may look this way for the next 100 years or even longer. Hey, you have it absolutely right. It is completely possible that no people will ever be able to live there. A and put yourself in, the, in these residents' shoes. If you have a child, do you really want to move back there? Are you really going to believe a government estimate that a certain amount of topsoil has been removed? So now you can drink the water from there. Now you can let your child play in the sandbox at school. That's the question. And so that's going to be a huge public debate as to whether or not it is ever going to be safe for people to return. As I said when I introduced your great reporting, Kyung Law, we appreciate you joining us tonight from Tokyo.